This film should be entitled Against the Turner Prize. Now we have here the most famous image associated with this prize, which has been largely run out of the Tate Gallery over the last quarter of a century or thereabouts, under the reign of uh, Nicholas Sirota. This is Damien Hirst's shark. It's called The Physical Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Someone Living, and it dates from 91, about 15 years ago now. Now, in a sense, it has a certain power because of the sheer physical magnificence of the shark. Sharks are perfect. They move, they eat, they kill, they make baby sharks. There's not an inch wasted. The force of creation that gave rise to them is yeah, divine, if you want to use that, with or without inverted commas. But, of course, the shark was there before Damien Hirst. So he's just made use of this image, and he's put it in formaldehyde in an enormous tank, about one and a half times in dimensions its length. This sold a couple of years ago to a very, very rich American, with obviously much more money than sense, for $12 million, or as the media pointed out here, £6 million. It is always remarkable how that figure keeps coming up again and again and again in the most unlikely context imaginable. Now, formaldehyde will not keep this shark, because in actual fact it should have been put in pure ethanol, and if Hearst was a taxidermist he'd know this, and this is a form of taxidermy rather than sculpture. It's sort of taxidermy masquerading as sculpture, if you like. To keep the shark, you should have injected ethanol into the shark and have steeped it, steeped the shark's body in pure alcohol. Eventually, over a 20, 30, 40 year span, and this case will be shipped back to the US and probably has been already, the shark will reduce in size. It will get slightly smaller and then smaller again. It will also eventually flip over, reverse itself and float down, reduced in size, to the bottom of the tank. So there's an auto-destructive or deconstructive element built into this art. And the reason for this art's existence, amongst many other factors, is that it is anti-artistic, as people who've had it boosted for them by the Sun newspaper of yesteryear partly understand. Why is it that a significant proportion of our people only know of the artistic culture of these islands through the Turner Prize, which is a postmodernist? minor exhibition which has been boosted out of all logicality and reason by certain middlemen, press and art dealing stroke gallery interests. Now that we've looked at this shark, we'll go on to a few other of these works and explore some of the ideas that lie behind them. This is an image of the murderer and sadist Mara Hindley by Marcus Harvey from 95. It's acrylic. Um, it's on canvas, of course, acrylic. The same effect as oil paint, but you use water um, for the most part. It's made up, or it's painted to look as though it's made up, from small handprints of children. Of course, she was a murderess with Ian Brady of children. Uh, she's got her, uh, the look that she had in the courtroom, and it's taken from a press photograph of the era. Uh, it's rather heavy sort of pre-Raphaelite virgin sort of um, look, um, sort of bottle blonde, sort of lugubrious 60s, um, a semi-iconic image of its time. Now, Harvey's used this to be quote-unquote offensive, to be anti-bourgeois, to be truculent, make a pathetic little rebellion, a statement of rebellion, uh, which many of these people are very keen on. He's done it to be quote-unquote outrageous, Many of these images, which are taken from um, Tate Modern, late Tate Britain, Sirota influence, Turner Prize art of yesteryear, because some of this stuff goes back the better part of a decade and a half now, is part of a movement which is against art as traditionally understood. It's sometimes called anti-art. It's essentially forms of conceptual art, which are an attack upon what people like, an attack upon bourgeois and middling notions in art, an attack on that which is considered to be passeist or outside of uh, the radical cutting edge of modernity. Um, although I would argue a lot of this stuff is not particularly avant-garde because it's been done before. The idea that by painting a murderer you actually uh, do something offensive because the murderer is an outsider in relation to bourgeois order relates to 
libertarian and liberal left views of crime, where the criminal is considered to be a re- rebel against the social order. Here's Mara Hindley, championed by Lord Longford for many a year, although whether he'd have approved of this particular image or not is debatable. When I met Lord Longford a long time ago, he said to me, I love Mara Hindley. I love Myra Hindley, he said, and I said to him by way of reply, do you really? I said, couldn't you find something better to sort of a uh, better object for the nature of your affections? I said, that what should have happened to Myra uh, was that she should have been hanged in 1962, and that would have been the end of it. But here we have this image by Harvey of, of an offensive sort, And when it was exhibited in the Sensation Exhibition at Billington House in Piccadilly, where the Royal Academy is, they had to hire various guerrillas to guard it from people who were throwing or attempting to throw eggs at it, which was all rather amusing. They also had an exclusion zone, like a hockey pitch, whereby they painted a white square in front of the image so that people who were stood beyond the boundary of this square couldn't, if they threw an egg, given the parabola of the egg, get to the picture. So all that was rather exciting. Uh, This is the Holy Virgin Mary, a Catholic and iconic image, of course, from 96. Again, another Turner Prize winner, stroke exhibit. This is by the African, I believe, Kenyan artist, Chris Ophili. This is uh, a black, bloated, uh, alleged uh, Mary, uh, Mother of God, um, with a sort of sex doll-like mouth covered in elephant dung. Um, The elephant dung is real, and he obtained it from the elephant enclosure at London Zoo in Camden, where Audia was deposited. He allegedly crept up when Warders wasn't looking and shoveled in several black bin liners full of this Audia and later attached it to these canvases. One of these works was bought for £20,000, £30,000, something like that, certainly less than 50000 by Chris Smith, MP. Chris Smith was the first Labour Arts Minister after Blair's landslide in 97. Um, it wasn't widely known uh, be outside certain metropolitan circles, but Smith, who's been a quote-unquote out homosexual for a very long time now, has been quote-unquote living with AIDS for the better part of 20 years. So, given that retroviral drugs take um, up at least £20,000 a year of one's money, in order to expedite the possibility that one doesn't develop AIDS and green loofers of infection growing out of one's skull and this sort of thing. The um, the combined price of Ophelia and the retrovirals is obviously quite significant in the Smith menage. This is an image of Tracy Emin's bed, my bed, from 98. Uh, She's never won the turn, although she's come close, and is one of its most quote-unquote controversial figures. An Anglo-Turkish girl born here, she basically, with this piece, is attempting what's called, in this anti-art tradition, the ready-made. One of the points about this type of art, and she's attempting to use certain quasi-feminist clichés during its adumbration, is the fact that it's not new. Hardly any of this stuff is really that original, because the ready-made begins with Marceau Duchamp in 1920, 1921, where he goes into a gallery with a urinal, one of these small ones, and says, prove to me it's not art, and it was later included as a quote-unquote ready-made in gallery spaces. She is essentially, in a rather sort of a chick-lit way, uh, revisiting this territory, and purportedly says that it's reasonably original. She is also, it's important to point out, part of a generation of so-called Brit-Pak artists who emerged in the 1990s. Gavin Turk herself and Damien Hurst of shark fame, uh, stroke infamy, is actually, uh, were actually a particular generation of students who came out of Goldsmith College of Art, superintended by one particular art lecturer um, in South London. So they're very much a rather in crowd who for a while in the 90s became a going concern, both aesthetically and commercially. There was also a very minor interface with the Blair regime. In the early years of the Blair government, there was this doctrine, half-articulated, of Cool Britannia, which consisted of a large number of allegedly cool and happening metropolitan persons who were gathered around Blair and co. to make them look funky and sort of down and real and quote-unquote with it. 
Nearly all of these types, of course, have been alienated and estranged by the course of new labour, and in particular, the Iraq War. Here's an image of the mask of blood, just called Self. Again from 1901, similar era with all of these works, by Mark Quinn, a conceptual sculpture um, from Liverpool. Now, Quinn is slightly more interesting than many of the other Brit Pack artists are called. Although he wouldn't really care for me pointing it out, particularly on behalf of a cultural video produced uh, on behalf of the British National Party, Quinn is actually a slightly traditional artist in the sense that he's looking back. Although the head of blood, refrigerated so it keeps its shape, appears to many people sort of garish or ghoulish or in poor taste, the death mask goes back to the ancient Greeks and is part of Western culture. When Beethoven died, an extraordinary mask was taken from him in death, showing the power of the man, a power that few of these artists, of course, could have come anywhere near replicating. But also Keats, when he died, an Italian took his death mask. It's a very old tradition in our culture. Of course, he's taken a mask from himself while living. And in a way, Quinn is hinting at going back, but only in a deconstructive way, only in a way that's fashionable with his liberal friends only in such a way as can get his work on at the present time. And his work certainly gets on. A crucified, uh, ethnically disprivileged Christ figure is one of his uh, previous efforts. And if you walk around Trafalgar Square, which a lot of people do at the present time, you will see an enormous sculpture at one end of the square, looking out upon the National Gallery, as it were. And this is 13 tons in weight. It's of a pregnant thalidomide victim called Alison Lapp. But even this, you know, relates to certain classical orders in sculpture. It's linear. It's representational. A lot of sculpture in the ancient world, of course, has limbs missing because they haven't survived. Some ancient pre-Hellenistic and pre-classical forms of tribal and Aboriginal art in a Western context show enormously pregnant women because, like the Venus of Willendorf, they are actually figures of primitive fertility and usually relate to religious fertility rights of one sort or another. So in a sense, Quinn is playing games, as a lot of these people are. He's bringing certain things back from the past in a way which is acceptable to Ken Livingstone's London. Um, ultimately, this society cannot decide what to do with the empty plinth in Trafalgar Square, because you can't have a hero, you can't have a military figure in this post-modernity on that plinth. Why? Because it's considered to be conceptually fascistic, that's why. And that's why they have pregnant thalidomide victims instead. Um, this is Great Deeds Against the Dead from 94 by the Chapman Brothers, who have a concept called Chapman World. Those who don't like grotesque abattoir or nudity should look away, but, um, uh, and don't put it on pause either. Now, this is based on Goya um, from the Peninsula War, uh, because the French committed a large number of other savage and atrocious deeds in the Peninsula War when we fought with the Spaniards against them. And the Chapmans are making a point about futility, folly, the morphology of the human. It partly does draw upon the classical tradition, actually, in a sort of abattoirial way. It means to shock, but it's actually more redolent of savagery and, the, and heroic cruelty than much of the rest of this art. And it actually, unlike a lot of their stuff, has more to do with the genuine Western tradition. Um, it's offensive, but then again, there's going to be plenty of severed bodies in Iraq... Uh, this is an image of two American tourists from the late 80s. Um, Life-size, obese Americans with cameras in tow, looking on, shopping in hand, slightly arrogantly, wondering what all these foreigners are doing when they themselves, of course, are abroad. Um, there is a certain truth to this one, and it is um, not disagreeable. This phenomenon is known as the ugly American abroad, even inside American mass culture. The American Embassy has distributed literature to hundreds of thousands of American tourists all over the world, trying to get them to say please and thank you, trying to get them to behave a little better abroad. This rather redundant and middling piece nevertheless has captured something of that. Um, lastly, this is a radical feminist image of a sort by Jenny Saville. Um, she specialises in unattractive female nudes in various abattoirial postures, 
she thinks that a glamorous sort of um, page three image of a woman is in actual fact a desecration and she's into the depiction of militant female ugliness as an anti-heterosexual, anti-bourgeois, anti-fellocratic and anti-family statement. So what do we have to say about this? Well, these bodies essentially look like bits of meat, don't they, in an abattoir, really, um, which is a surrealist tradition that goes back to the beast in the 30s and the 40s who used to paint in abattoirs to get the right savagery, to get the right sort of effect. But in the end, Savile is just producing images of ugly women that look like trussed up abattoirial specimens. So it's the sort of um, pictorial equivalent of Andrea Dworkin's ideology, rich in paint, in ugliness, in obesity, in its unattractiveness to men, as a mute and futile statement of the absence of motherhood. Now, it had a look at quite a few Turner Prize images, the Tate Modern, late Tate Britain images. What is this art about, and where does it come from? Also, why has it been pushed, particularly by a mass-market tabloid newspaper, like The Sun, of all things? To deal with the things in correct order, these works come out of conceptual art. Conceptual art is an art movement that pretty much began in the 1960s, but there are antecedents further back in modernism. Modernism is a very old idea, and goes back to the middle of the 19th century with the Impressionists. This type of anti-art comes from the 60s, but relates to a movement which um, was in protest against Western civilization at the end of the Great War. This movement was named after a child sort of gurgle, and was called Da 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 Dadism. Yes, and this movement, which uh, flowered for a brief, brief period as Weimar Germany in particular was coming in, just after Germany's defeat in the Great War, late uh, second decade of the 20th century, early 1920s, attempted to produce a pastiche of childish, infantilistic art as a protest against the adult society, which had led to the carnage of Flanders. Now, factoring forward about 40 years, the hippie and left and countercultural movement of the 1960s, best known for its inflections in fashion and music, also had an artistic side. They rebelled against the art work as object, and they wanted to create objectless art. They wanted to create anti-middle-class art, anti-bourgeois conceptual art, which would be totally resistant to the blandishments of the market. You notice the hypocrisy here, because this image that we have before us now, Hearst Chubb, has just been sold for many millions of pounds and dollars, depending. Over time, that which was ugly, fierce, deconstructive, melted down against the grain, against society, against traditional tastes, even within modernism, has become acceptable, and has in turn become a vehicle of exchange which can be exchanged for vast amounts of money. And the Sarches in particular have been buying this work from this post-Goldsmith set for many a long year. They have a warehouse in Leighton, in the inner East London, that burnt down rather recently, and uh, a cynical Catholic friend of mine rang me up after this warehouse had burnt down with a lot of this stuff in it, and said, you know, there is a God. And uh, what he was trying to say by that was that um, there was a sort of righteous vengeance for all this, but in actual fact, at the material level of existence, it was some faulty electrical fitting which caused the thing to burn down. One of the exhibits that was burnt down was an enormous array of sort of quasi pedophile dolls, which were arranged by the ubiquitous Chapman brothers as part of their Chapman world. When I attended the, when I attended the Sensation exhibition at the Royal Academy in Burlington House, Piccadilly, a couple of years ago, this was the one with the crowd outside and the demonstrations against the Mara Hindley image and so on. I noticed that there was a sign before you entered an inner section of the exhibition. This related to the Chapman world's efforts, because you had to prove, in a sense, at least conceptually, that you were over 18 years of age before you could go in and see these allegedly shocking images and that sort of thing. But in actual fact, it's all unoriginal stuff, because this was done by Belmer in the 1920s and 30s. He was a surrealist who, in a mute protest against a certain German regime that then existed, produced a large number of naked female dolls uh, in various poses. It relates to Balthus's paintings as well. So there's a degree to which none of this stuff is original. The shark is a return to the ready-made of Duchamp and later of Warhol. So is Emin's efforts, her unmade bed, her anti-art, her scissors that won't cut, that the... Um, 
sort of uh, camping tent that consists of the names of uh, aborted fetuses and all the men she slept with, and so on and so forth. It's actually recidivistic material. It's a dog returning to its own vomit, if you pardon the phrase. All of this sort of thing has been done before, and partly done to death. There was a pop band, I believe, called Pop Will Eat Itself, and there is a degree to which this is postmodern art devouring itself, returning to various sources early in the century, deconstructing itself, acting against its own tradition, rather like many of these contemporary operas where, you know, they have Don Giovanni, but then they put a toilet on stage because they're acting against the piece, it's called. But they're doing so because they're bored, because they haven't got anything to say, by virtue of the fact that they're sort of liberal and decadent. And it's less the modernism of style and finish than the valuelessness that lies behind it, which has to be our source of critique. You may now feel that we've done the Turner Prize to death, but not quite. Because in our talk about the negation of the aesthetics of the Turner Prize and related brick pack artistry, we're now going to turn the clock back to go forwards. The important point about the rightist attitude towards modernity and modern art is not to be quote-unquote reactionary. One should not reject the modern, one should change the vortex and the system of values and energy that lie behind what's ended up with turds in boxes, which is actually an artwork from the 1970s by a so-called conceptual artist named Manzoni. An Italian-American heiress bought his own ordeal in a gilded box for $7,000 US. So in Rome, she could actually, rather Dolce Vita-like, sort of say to her decadent and sophisticated friends that this is what she had done. But we wish to move away from that towards radical but traditional art, and there can be nothing more radical and nothing more traditional in our conspectors of new against old and rival forms of modern artistry, uh, albeit historically displaced, than church gargoyles. These images, which sometimes are called corbels in Yorkshire, and which influenced very strongly the young Henry Moore in their three-dimensional form, are post-medieval images and medieval images in turn. They are to ward off evil spirits mythologically. They are powerful. They are on the interface of ugliness and beauty, which is part and parcel of the modernist aesthetic per se. In this particular image, which is in the royal seat of Windsor at St. George's Chapel, uh, on the exterior, we see an anthropomorphic figure, partly lion-like, partly uh, semi-animal stroke human, wrestling with a fetus, wrestling with a child that's partly under its arm. Is it guarding it? Is it throttling it? Are they both crying out? Are they in pain? Or are they in joy? Now, this is a very powerful image made by an artist working in traditional church art and the craftsmanship and genuine artistry of the post-medieval interior and exterior. It's a superb piece of work. We will never know the man's name. But this piece of work is far more important than Hearst and Turk and Emin and some of Quinn's and many of the others. And there are thousands of these images in our churches up and down the land. It is an image of power. It's a trinity. It's visceral. It's ten times more powerful than anything these Turner Prize people can produce. And why is that? It's because it's based on belief and it's based on a semiotic of meaning and there are values that lie behind it that reach into the depths and come out from them. This is another uh, image from tradition which is more radical than that of alleged modernity. It's a mermaid holding a fish on the exterior of Exeter Cathedral. Again, one sees a strong image of powerful femininity rooted in medieval craftsmanship Many of the men who produce these sorts of images wouldn't have considered themselves to be artists, but they're actually very great artists. And it puts uh, Jenny Savile and her ilk into the shade. The reason is that it relates to canons of preconceived aesthetic beauty, female beauty perceived heterosexually through the male eye. And don't forget, this is on the exterior of a church. So one has erotic mythological imagery of a heterosexual character as part of the tradition in stone, of conceived Christianity. The difference between it and the Turner art which we've had uh, across this uh, screen in the early part of our talk is that these images are rooted in belief. 
they exist in the mind of the artist prior to their execution if they don't draw them prior to the sculpting of them they're drawn mentally in their own mind they proceed to the object they're pro-object they're object friendly and they believe in objectification it is not as Metzger would say art against the object or autodestructive art as his little movement essentially confined to himself in the 70s testified to so we have here the inverse of the Turner methodology both in its praxis in its prior beliefs and the form that it comes out with and in the end it ends with an object which although it may not be to everyone's taste relates to the instinctive understanding of beauty as conceived by the majority of people uh, this is a rather dragon-like or reptilian head, a gargoyle head uh, from a church in Yorkshire it's a sort of form of white aboriginal art virtually by a craftsman who's totally unknown, he's from Hedden it's described as the termination of a string course, but it'll be on the outside of a provincial, probably rural church, uh, facing downwards, looking ferociously at somebody who is looking up. It relates to a sort of antithetical principle, really, sort of evil to ward off evil in a way. Um, but it's a, a figure of quasi-satanic majesty put on the outside of a Christian church by a northern craftsman and artist of genius because that's what these corporal um, sculptors were make no bones about it these uh, men uh, exemplify the gothic tradition and they exemplify Flemish art transplanted to the north of England in stone and in three dimensions on the outside of our churches uh, when modernists of a turn of prize sort but not of the sort which could be characterised by a Lewis or even a William Roberts, talk about power as beauty. They should look at images like this. Here's a monkey whipping its young on the York Chapter House. It's a superb image, a sort of um, a silent version of King Kong, truly silent and in stone uh, several centuries beforehand. It's a sort of uh, deeply anthropologically knowledgeable image. The form of the beast is correctly captured. Uh, it's sort of an imp of the perverse image. Don't forget, the monkey in this configuration is completely pre-existing any evolutionary theories that might look at higher primates and simians in a different way to the way that this sculptor looked upon them. But it's another of these grotesques and images of European fantasy on the outside of our churches in traditional cities like York looking on beating its young an image of the primordial of the powerful of the most savage of that from which we have come we now move from the outside of a church or cathedral to the inside this is in Ripon Cathedral and it's an elephant with a sort of um, travelling house on top of it a sort of canopied structure on the back of the beast that humans could, and other goods could be carried in. It's probably influenced by um, Clive's uh, forays into India. There's a sort of post-imperial feel to this piece. It's on the edge of a row of seats or pews inside the body of Ripon Cathedral. The interesting thing to me about this image is the imagination that's gone into it, is the delineation. It's a sort of piece of white Aboriginal art in a way. It's fierce. It's visceral. It's militantly three-dimensional. The thing is alive. It's protein. Uh, when Henry Moore from Yorkshire was very young, he went to see Wyndham Lewis at the, uh, in the 1930s, and he said to him, what's sculpture about? And Lewis said, have no fear. Relate to the past. Be aware of past precedents, but create for yourself in the time when you're alive. Believe that all is plastic under your vision, and you can change the world anew. Think only of power and beauty in form. And this element, uh, this elementary and elemental sculpture of the, element, of the elephant in wood inside Ripon Cathedral has it. This is a more abstract piece in many ways. It's slightly florid. It could be conceived as uh, more feminine, weaker than the others. But it's still a powerful piece. It's a caterpillar in its sort of vegetation laid out in a sort of slightly mosaic way, in a slightly patterned way, 
It's not meant, in my opinion, to be too clear. It's sort of um, slightly serene and also slightly surreal. It's also strongly related to the purity of natural form, bearing in mind it's on stone and it's outside Exeter Cathedral on one of its walls. A caterpillar in foliage. It's probably quite a bit better, three-dimensionally speaking, than a Turner Prize exhibit such as, quote-unquote, My Dead Dad. Uh, this is an image, again, on the outside of a church, which could come completely from the British Museum, but is ancestral to our art here. It's a crocodile head from Kilpeg in Hertfordshire, and it's almost abstract, in a way, in its power, in its delineation. There's a hint of what in classical art will be called the worm Ouroboros. This is the snake that devours its own tail and is a serpent within a circle of fire and represents a primeval Indo-European racial and cultural symbol. But there's great power in this imagery as the head comes out of the stone in one way, reflexively, to devour. In the culture which it originates from, the crocodile is a serpent, is a dragon, is a snake, represents the snake in the Garden of Eden, represents knowledge, fulfillment, desire, eros, and the choice that humans have to make in this life. Here's another image which is ancient and yet modern. Bearing in mind that a lot of these uh, monsters depict the horrid, quote-unquote, but they do so from the perspective of the 12th century imagination. So we're looking at work which, give or take the odd hundred years, is a millennia old. It's a thousand years old, yet it springs out fully formed. This is a monster from York Museum. You see a man with a club fending off various demons of the dark, nearly always configured in reptilian terms. The reptilian part of the brain, if you believe in evolutionary brain theory, is devouring the individual in the 12th century imagination. The mouths come out, the body of the sinner, as it were, is devoured and carnivorously ripped asunder. Although the delineation in this piece of three-dimensional relief refers to the soul and to the spirit of man, corporealized, seen as a body, on the outside of a church, now in the inside of a Yorkshire museum. Yes, here's a sort of horror video of its time, in a way. It's a vaulting boss uh, from uh, Elston in Gloucestershire. You've got four interconnected heads here around a sort of Celtic cross and interconnecting nodal point from which their sort of skull heads radiate. You can see the mouths, you can see the teeth, you can see the eyes. They're gruesome, they're grim, they're devouring, they're diabolical and yet divine. Um, it's a, quite a small space by the looks of it, and it's carved in a sort of kaleidoscope of malevolent stone. It's like a sort of image from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, but it's a thousand years back, and it shows the fecundity of the English medieval imagination. These are forms of traditional primitive art. This one, which represents an early angel, represents uh, a sort of uh, powerful, chthonic, early image of an angel based upon Romanesque precepts. There seems to be an eagle or a bird of some sort above it. The eagle cosmologically often represents the superior part of the spirit soaring above. You've got the angel with a sword that seems to be fighting with such the, a creature. You have the wings coming out of the back of the angel. It's very much in stone relief, the sort of art that existed in the catacombs from whence Christianity emerged to take the Roman Empire and then the Western world. It's from Kilpeck, and it's yet another of these examples of primitive art, which in its power of statement far exceeds postmodern primitivism and post-industrial primitivism, which doesn't believe in anything. Yes, this is an image inside Coventry Cathedral as was, um, it's now destroyed, of course, because of the bombing of Coventry during the war, which decimated the cathedral and forced post-war planners to rebuild it. Now, in this image, to concentrate on this first, we see a sort of rather avuncular angel. Um, with these massive wings that are like an eagle bursting from its frame on either side, possibly playing a harp here, given the plane of the instrument to the body. Uh, Wide-eyed, the eyes have no eyeballs. Um, alive, vigorous, very powerfully present and three-dimensional, poised, a certain repose 
but almost a certain jocular aggression. Now, there's an interesting story here, because when Coventry Cathedral and environs was destroyed, it was rebuilt uh, along essentially contemporary lines. Lots of concrete used in the new cathedral, Graham Sutherland, um, a figurative and anthropomorphic artist who melded shapes in nature together to produce reliefs in the 50s and was a rival to Bacon for artistic preeminence within modernism at that time, produced the stained glass for the new cathedral. And a woman who was apparently some slightly crazed Christian believer came up from the south coast with a hammer to the Midlands to attack this object, the crucifixion, a staple of Western art throughout the millennia, um, because she didn't like the look of it and because she considered it to be a desecration. But the idea of Sutherland being a bit of a desecration is, in contemporary terms, a bit of a nonsense, because Sutherland relates to primitive art traditions that go back to these medieval carvers and stonemasons and workers in the three-dimensional, because his images of the Christ are images that predate early Renaissance art, they're Romanesque, they're Byzantine, they're gothically primitive, they are white Aboriginal pieces of non-classical refinement. Here's another ancestral and traditional English image. It is from Worcester Cathedral. It's entitled The Tournament. It's a relief, of course, because it's not three-dimensional in the round, so you look at it one way on. It's of a joust. If you've ever seen the uh, 1950s Hollywood film, quite a good film, Ivanhoe, of Walter Scott's epic, you'll know what I mean. We have the two warriors fighting it out within the context of Christian dominion. Possibly there's two ladies, maybe, on either side, or they're people, they're warriors who are fighting on behalf of women who tie their ribbons to the lances. Even if the lance goes through one of them and pins them to the heart, they'll have a sort of grand dames uh, ribbon on the tip. So we have here glory, the heroic, the masculine, the violent, the English, or at least the uh, post-Norman, in the context of a religion of peace, because it is important to understand that the medieval period and thereafter was not a dispensation of Christian humanism. It was a traditional Western and organic society whose belief system, semiotically, was Judeo-Christian. But this type of warriorship predates Christianity and is there at the very beginnings of our culture and, of course, in the better traditions of even the contemporary armed forces, still exists. Uh, this is a powerful, a primeval and a triumphant image. The eagle is cardinal to Western civilization. In Nietzsche's uh, Thus Spake Zarathustra, the um, arch archetypal Aryan Persian mystic Zarathustra, the originator of Zoroastrianism, has two pets. One is an eagle and one is a serpent. And this goes back to ancient Greece, where the gods, in particular Zeus, the primary god, after the overthrow of the Titans before him, has pets like an eagle that symbolizes courage and partially masculinity, and a snake which symbolizes partially femininity and knowledge. Because in this life, all you need, deep down, is courage and knowledge. Now this is in Wiganhall, St. Wiganhall's Church. It's part of a brass lectern. A divine would have stood before this, next to this, alongside it, and given a Christian oration. One sees in all of this art the narrative of Christianity unfolding through the replication of primeval Indo-European imagery in an English and British context. But you have to understand that this type of Christianity is very much integrated completely into the doctrine of the Western civilization and obtruding out of it in a heroic image like this, no matter how Christian the context is the paganism that went before. Uh, here we have an interesting and rather paradoxical image from St. Albans. Um, it comes from the 1500s. Are they heroic sort of rearing sheep? Paradox upon paradox? Or are they sort of um, Romanesque and rather half-formed lions, uh, which don't particularly look li li lion-like? Or Who knows? But they're interesting rearing creatures on either side of a heraldic motif. Uh, for a late abbot, the eagle again appears, triumphantly, claws out, wings distended. 
It again shows this sort of heroic and martial element, even for a dead cleric, in the three-dimensional stonework of early modern and approaching the Reformation Christianity. Uh, here we have a traditional heraldic device in stone. Um, Margaret Patton's London, the lion and the unicorn, traditional images of the royal house and of England. Heroic, mythological, of course, in the case of the unicorn. Rearing, um, the, symbolizing the union. Florid, there's a sort of baroque and even rococo feel to the thing. It's deliberately stylized, deliberately ornate. A fierce, and yet exaggerated in the splendor of its display. It's almost like a patriotic peacock display in stone. It's a relief, but it has certain of the energy and solidity of a three-dimensional work that you can actually walk round, because it fills its own space and extends from it. Now, with all of this traditional material that we've been looking at as a response to the Turner Prize formulations of earlier in this talk, we are attempting not just a reversal, we're not just being reactionary in liberal terms going back. We're going back to go forwards because when you look at this art, you realize it has far more energy, far more life, far more vigor. It's more alive, even if it speaks to us across half a millennia or a thousand years and more. Why is this? It's because, as I have already intimated, it's pre-formulated. It comes out of an organic culture. The artist expresses racial essence through cultural form. It has a dynamism and a vigour and an arrow which shoots into the future. One doesn't have to be a Christian at all to appreciate it because Christianity was the narrative and the semiotic of our culture. When our warriors went abroad, when they killed foreigners, when they did what was necessary for this country, they had a cross on their shields and on their jerkins. But they were pagans who had a cross and this is what this Christianity really means and is. This tradition has now died. And one sees in the deconstructive art of modernity and late modernity, as exemplified by the Turner Prize, a sort of anti-Western tradition, a sort of narrative impulse which is against the bloodline of our own history and identity. It doesn't portend to all of these works. There's some quality to some of them in a nuanced way. Some of them are hinting at elements beyond themselves, which I personally see in the work of Quinn amongst others but they would have to go back to go forward, and they have committed the cardinal mistake that much of modernism is research and development for classical art as was. Everything has to be renewed, just as Rodin, the great French sculptor, renewed neoclassical art at the end of the 19th century by injecting into it Impressionist movement. This art can go on, can be reinvigorated, but it involves the British people, the English people, and their intellectuals and artists in particular, recovering their spirit and recovering their dynamism as a people to go forwards into the future. Art is the creation in objective form of the spiritual nature of a people. A people is essentially a racial grouping, even though the English are not a race, nor are the British. We are part of the Indo-European or white race, which is a polarity within the overall anthropological designation of the pale. We are a race, and then a culture, and we culturalize ourselves through nationality and through a feeling of belonging. The more English you are, the more British you are, and the more British you are, the more European you are, which has nothing to do with the precepts or bureaucratic structures of the so-called European Union. And the more European you are within a hierarchy of values, aesthetically and biologically, the more Indo-European you are. With this art that we have looked at as a volte face to the Turner Prize superimposed upon us by the semi-artistic dictatorship of Sirota and his ilk, we see a prior world. We see a world which pre-existed much of what has occurred since the war. It can exist again. It shall exist again. It exists within the genetic makeup of the British people. All we have to do is to reach into the present with the many talented artists who exist at this time. It's quite a mistake to think that they don't exist at this time. The sun would have it otherwise, but the contrary is the truth. And we need to wrench from the artistic presentation of the present. The folly that exists within most of the exhibits that come forward under the banner of the Turner Prize. 
Let us to return to tradition to go forwards with modernity in a different direction.